Thank you very much everyone for joining the webinar for the Small Vessel Replacement Programme, the first one that we've, we've carried out. Um, tonight uh, I'm joined by colleagues from Transport Scotland and CalMac as well as CMAL. My name is Lewis Hamill, I'm a Technical Superintendent at CMAL and the Project Manager for this Small Vessel Replacement Programme. Just to give you a bit of a background on the webinar itself, we will be approximately one hour 30 minutes. I appreciate we've ran over slightly there, so we will make up the time at the other end if people can, can hang on. And time for Q&A within the session. Just for those that aren't maybe aware, we have a dedicated project page for the SVRP, which is cmassets.co.uk slash project slash SVRP. You'll find all information on the project there. And following this webinar, we'll put a, a copy of the recording and a PDF copy of the presentation on this website. A recording of the presentation will also be on the CMAL YouTube channel, as we've done for pre previous webinars. Following uh, this webinar, we'll also take all the questions we received tonight and put them into a Q&A document. Um, that'll include all the questions that we answer and those that were unable to answer in the allotted time. Um, but, but please be assured we will answer all questions over the next couple of weeks. And as I've already kind of said, just please be aware this presentation will be recorded. Um, it will just be the presentation plus myself and my colleagues that are speaking that will be recorded. For the Q&A session, this will take place at the end of the presentation. But during the presentation, please feel free to type some questions into the chat box, which you can see as an example on the right hand side here. The Q&A session will be uh, conducted by Brian Fulton, who is our Head of Business Support at CMO. When you're typing into the chat box, it is optional whether you use your name or if you want to just leave it as anonymous, it's totally up to yourself. When we do publish the Q&A document, there'll be no names included, so it will be completely anonymous. Um, as I've already said, any questions that we've not managed to answer tonight, we will answer over the coming weeks and put in the Q&A document. You can also uh, email us with any further questions. So if you think of something after this webinar takes place, we've got a, an email address there, svrp at cmassets.co.uk. Please feel free to email us in, but please be aware it may be a couple of days before we get back to you just with, with a number of projects we have going on, but we will get back to you. So thank you very much everyone for your time, for joining and for your questions in advance. And we'll now continue on with the webinar. Order of the webinar. So tonight we're going to go through some introduction and background on the program, uh, touch on the vessel concept design and feasibility studies, as well as the port feasibility studies that go alongside that. We're then going to speak about, about the in scope routes and the deployment plan options, and then focus on the planning dates and the kind of summary and the way forward for the program. And then, as, as I've said, followed by the Q and A and the feedback session. The next slide, please, Declan. The next slide up is the journey to net zero. So Scotland's climate change legislation sets the target to achieve net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045. The programme will aim to replace up to 10 small vessels serving the Clyde and Everdeen Ferry Services Network, that's the CHIFS network, due to operational life expiry across two phases. Specific engagement with communities set to benefit from the programme will be undertaken once a detailed deployment plan has been developed. The current status of the programme is the development phase, which includes the outline business case, the OBC, the vessel concept design and feasibility studies, the port feasibility studies and the vessel procurement documentation. The strategic business case, the SBC, has been approved and the outline business case, OBC, is currently in progress. And a bit of background here, the journey to net zero. So Scotland is committed to reducing its emissions by 75% by 2030 and to a legally binding target of net zero emissions by 2045. Our goal at CMO is to provide a standardised, modern, state-of-the-art ferries with all electric zero emission operation on various routes along the west coast of Scotland. 
The programme will aim to replace up to 10 small vessels serving the Clyde and Hebridean Ferry Services Network due to operational life expiry across two phases. Specific engagement with communities set to benefit from the programme will be undertaken once a detailed deployment plan has been developed. The current status of the programme is the development phase, which includes outline business case, the vessel concept design, the feasibility studies, the port feasibility studies and the vessel procurement documentation. The strategic business case has been approved and the outline business case is in progress. So the programme phases, the programme will be split into two phases prior to the feasibility studies in August 2021. Phase one, so that, that I should say this was prior to the initial feasibility studies which took place in August 2021. So phase one is to replace up to six or seven vessels operating in routes with less stringent route classifications, i.e. Euro C and UK categorised waters. Phase two will replace up to three or four vessels operating in routes with more stringent route classifications such as Euro B waters. After those feasibility studies, I'm looking into August 2022, phase one will now look to replace up to six to seven standardised vessels that can operate on all route categorizations, including Euro B. And phase two will now look to replace up to three or four vessels with a more specific design is required. During phase one, CMLT have investigated vessel designs that complies with change regulatory requirements for the original phase two routes. So the program working group that we've got set up, um, you can see here in the chart on the right hand side, it's set up to ensure that the new vessels and their service and operational requirements meet the needs of the routes and communities, including with respect to infrastructure fit and operational efficiencies. It will provide a central forum for discussions and for communications and provide and deliver a clear communications and engagement plan. So into a bit more detail with the reference group. CML have set up a reference group to bring together the programme working group, local authorities, high trans, SPT and the community board. Members have been invited to provide feedback on problems and constraints relating to the current small vessel fleet and associated ports and harbours. It will also provide input to project objectives, user needs and any infrastructure requirements. It will also provide feedback on design options generated. The reference group meets approximately every quarter and has had three meetings so far, going back to December 2021. As the programme becomes more detailed and breaks into route specific projects for each small vessel introduction, further stakeholder reference groups will be created at a more local level with selected representatives from all levels of stakeholders. This will also include third party harbour representatives, community councils, ferry committees, lawyers and local businesses. So some of the existing vessels that we have at the moment in the small vessel fleet uh, ranges from the Isle of Cumbria going back to 1977, all the way through to the latest additions to our fleet, which was the hybrid diesel electric battery vessels that we um, deployed in 2013, 2014 and 2016. Some of the vessels that are not in scope for this project are the Cavoria, which serves Kerra, the Loch Nevis, which serves the small isles of Egg, Canna, Rum and Muck, uh, the Krush and the Loch Frisa. So again, just to touch on some of the in scope routes prior to the concept design kicking off, so prior to the commencement of the feasibility studies in August 2021, the following routes were in scope for phase one and phase two. Phase one, Euro C and UK categorised water routes that included Oban to Lismore, Wargs to Cymru, Gia to Tainlone, Colin Tribe, Rubada, Malig, Armadale and the Loch Winnie, which is a really festival and moves around the network as and when required. Other routes to be considered as part of phase one 
we've got the Port of Addy Tarbert, the Sconster Rassi, Wachau and Fishnish, Wach Ranza Clinic, and the really fessel the Wach Brewster. Phase two was to include the Euro B routes, and that includes Tobermory, Kilcoen, Iona, Finnefort, Barra, Erskate, and Bernary, Leverborough. So Iona, Barra, and Bernary routes, they are all Euro B classification, and Tobermory, Kilcoen is a Euro C in the summer, but does move to Euro B in the winter. So just some additional notes at this stage, there was no deployment plan in place and no decisions had been made on whether existing vessels are disposed or retained. It was known that the programme will require a series of new builds, but will also require some existing vessels to be redeployed around the network. During phase one, CMAL were to investigate vessel designs that comply with regulatory requirements for the phase two routes. For Largs Cumbria, the new vessel would be to replace the lock ridden and to be the secondary vessel. So just before we get into the kind of detail of the new small vessels, just to give you an idea of the different phases that we have from the concept to vessel delivery. So for the concept design, which is the first uh, bar you can see there on the chart, we along with the assistance of some design consultants, some naval architect consultants, which in this case is Nivalu, a, a German company who we've worked very closely with recently on the, the Isla vessels. And we developed the vessel concept design um, that meets all of the functional requirements. When we then move on to the kind of tender stage and then into the, the, the basic design, the detailed design and the build of the vessel, this then becomes the, the shipyard's responsibility. But CMAL do work closely with the shipyard to make sure that the vessels that are delivered are what is required and meets the requirements. And as well as our requirements, um, the vessel also has to comply with the following. So the EC directive, which is still, this is a European document, but even though Brexit has taken place, this is still very much in use. Um, also, the MCA rules and regulations, as Declan has already touched on, there is varying classification requirements here in terms of routes, and we do have some UK categorised uh, waters which follow the rules of the MCA. And then classification side to rules and regulations, which for the majority of our vessels is Lloyd's Register, but this won't be decided until the build stage. And then, of course, IMO regulations. Next slide, please, Declan. Declan. OK, just to give you an idea of, of the vessel and service requirements that we have here. So as Declan had touched on earlier, one of the key goals of this project is zero emission operation or as close to possible. So that is our number one requirement here. But of course, we have a lot of other important competing requirements such as vehicle capacity. So we have two designs that we're going to come on to talk about based upon a 25 vehicle capacity and a 15 vehicle capacity. Um, then on to reliability and resilience. So we're trying to improve that with these new vessel designs. Meet at this moment in time the existing timetables. There's no plan changes uh, at this stage. Uh, a clear driving height and width. So trying to keep the car deck as clear as possible. Make sure there's no obstructions uh, limiting any uh, high sided vehicles, etc. Um, dead weight and payload. So try and maximise as much of the carrying capacity as possible. A double ended vessel. Um, with bow and stern loading in line with the existing small vessel fleet. Operation off of one and eight slipways, as we also currently do with the small vessel fleet, bar, bar one route with their uh, operating off link spans. Be able to carry dangerous goods. A passenger capacity of 150, which we'll come on to talk about. Passenger facilities, we'll come on to talk about in a second, along with accessibility, and the same with crew facilities and stores on the vessel. Next slide, please, Declan. So just to give you an idea of some of the companies that have been involved in the feasibility studies. So we've worked with a, a wide range of companies over the past year. As I'd mentioned, the value are involved with um, being the main kind of consultant here, assisting us with uh, the concept design. The value also work closely with HSVA, who are Hamburg Ship Basin and are really at the forefront of hydrodynamic research and also worked closely on the Isla vessels. As I'd said, um, Classification Society won't be 
decided until the build stage, but we have been working very closely with Lloyd's Register and working very closely with the MCA, who are the flag state authority for the UK. For the port side, um, we have Mott MacDonald, who have been carrying out the port feasibility studies, and we've been working closely with uh, Scottish and Southern Electricity Network, SSCN, uh, for the shore power feasibility studies. They are responsible for all ports except Largs, which is the uh, responsibility of Scottish power. And for the vessel, we've also been working with various major equipment suppliers, including such uh, battery suppliers, propulsion experts, etc. Next slide, please, Declan. OK, I won't go into every single thing in detail here, but it just gives you an idea of everything we have to consider here for the feasibility studies. This is both the vessels and ports, but a main focus on the vessel. So from service and operational requirements right through to the benefits and disbenefits of the options we've looked at, the costs, the CAPEX, the OPEX, and then right through to the timetables that they're going to operate. Uh, next slide, please, Declan. So now we come on to the design variants. So based upon the forecast demand that has been carried out by Transport Scotland and CalMac, two vehicle capacities were identified for the in-scope routes that we'd mentioned, and these were 25 and 15 PCUs, PCUs just being a, a car unit. Um, so this same forecast demand has also identified that passenger capacity of 150 would be sufficient for all routes and for all design variants. So this has led us to, to these two designs, a design A and a design B, uh, not to be confused with any route classification, um, but we have the A and the B here. So A is capable of 25 cars and 150 passengers, and the smaller design B is capable of 15 cars and 150 passengers. The image on the right here is actually of one of the hybrid vessels, but it's just there for, for comparison for, for future purposes. Next slide, please, Declan. OK, we now do have a third design, which is a design C. So as part of this small vessel replacement programme, we have offered our services uh, along with the values out to all the local authority ferry operators in Scotland. So this includes our Gillen Butte Council, Shetland Islands Council and Orkney Islands Council, as well as Highland Council. So the free former that I mentioned there, um, the requirements that they're looking for for their new vessels within their fleet are slightly out of the scope of what we've been looking at. Um, however, the requirements of Highland Council were very much within our scope and uh, looking for very similar requirements to what we are uh, looking for in terms of a vessel design. So based upon their own forecast demand, Highland Council identified that they would require two replacement vessels with a vehicle capacity of 32 PCUs per vessel. And this led to a design C, which is capable of taking 32 cars and 150 passengers. This design C uh, with the high, higher vehicle capacity has been checked against the church routes and it has been identified that it will not be required. So that means it won't be required for the CalMac routes. Um, all findings that we have from this small vessel replacement programme, so at the end of the concept design and feasibility study, we will then share with the other three local authorities, so with Arkell and Butte, with Shetland Islands and with Orkney Islands, um, that can then hopefully inform them for their own vessel designs. Next slide, please, Declan. So if we compare these three different design variants, as you can see on the table there, also in blue, we have the hybrid vessels, so the Halley, the Loch and Var and the Katrina, and then the green uh, column you can see is the typical Loch class vessel. So this is Loch Striven, Loch Ridden, Loch Ranza um, type vessels, their typical sizes. Um, so the length and beam have been derived from the vehicle carrying capacity requirement, so the number of PCUs. So as you can see, for all three designs, we have the same overall length, which is approximately 50 metres. The real important one here is the rule length, which is the 46.2. We don't want to then go beyond the 50 metres as it introduces uh, other, other rules into the design, which we, we don't want to include. Um, where these designs vary is their beam. So if you look at design A, we have a, a beam of 12.6 metres, design B 10.4 metres and design C 14 metres. And what that basically equates to is design A has three car lanes, design B has two car lanes and design C has four car lanes. Um, 
So you might look at that and think this seems a bit crazy that all three would be the exact same length. This does have advantages, mainly the whole side profile of the ship will be the exact same, so the same windage for all three vessels, regardless of their kind of size and displacement. Um, it also, from a structural point of view, when building the ships, has a lot of commonality between the vessels in terms of the longitudinal, uh, sorry, the, the transverse framing. And um, that's the kind of real reason here. For design B, we have considered a shorter beamier vessel, a bit more in line with the, lock, the kind of typical lock class vessels. Um, but this really would have a negative impact on the hydrodynamic performance of the vessel, meaning that the vessel would require more energy uh, to push it through the water and to meet the timetable. And as we are looking to get as close to zero emission as possible, we really want to reduce that energy requirement so that we can include uh, the full capacity of batteries within the vessel to last the full timetable. As you will see, the draft is now 2.14 metres, which is quite a difference compared to even the hybrid vessels. Um, the largest drafted small vessel we have at the moment, not including the, the recent Loch Freesia, is the Loch Shearer, which is around 1.83. So we have made quite a jump here, and we'll come on to talk about that in a wee bit more. But the real benefit that this brings is it can allow a more optimised hull form, which is more efficient, requiring less energy, and it means that we can adopt the full battery capacity to last the timetable within the vessel. So that is um, out of kind of rule of thumb here, we're thinking that the 2.14 metre draft has about 30% less energy compared to the hybrid vessels. All designs will have identical wheelhouses, passenger lounges and crew areas, which we'll come on to talk about. Next slide, please, Declan. Starting off with passenger spaces. So this image on the right here, this is just a 3D structural model of the kind of proposed design. So there's, there's no ramps or anything. There's not a lot of detail included there. It's just really the structure. So as you can see from this, all of the superstructure, including the wheelhouse, is over to one side. So this would, is slightly different compared to some of our vessels, such as uh, the hybrids, where you've got you've not got accommodation on both sides, but you do have kind of overhangs on the other side, and the wheelhouse is over the top of the car deck. This means that we have a clear drive width. It means that we also don't have any uh, height issues in terms of uh, high-sided vehicles, HGVs. Um, so the, the idea would be that there would be one internal lounge, uh, which is almost shown as the big block on the starboard side, the right side of the vessel. Um, and that would have a capacity for approximately 75 seats. And then we'd have one external area, so the sun deck, with again approximately 75 seats. Um, we would include for that number of seats and number of passengers, three passenger toilets would be provided, and this would include an accessible toilet. Uh, the passenger layouts, particularly the internal areas, will follow uh, the kind of new vessels in the fleet and will be to, to a high standard. Uh, there's no intention to provide any retail offering for these vessels, as we have in line with the other existing small vessels. And next slide, please, Declan. Sticking with passenger areas, but focusing mainly on accessibility on board the vessel. So we will align uh, with best practice and legislative equality and accessibility guidance and standards um, as far as practical for a small vessel. Now, the reason we say that for a small vessel is it can be a lot more challenging to accommodate some things on a small vessel, such as a lift, where it's it's fairly easy to do so on a, on a major vessel. So here are a lot of the items that we will be including. And there's one item you can see at the end there that's still kind of under investigation. So we will provide an accessible toilet, as I've, I've mentioned. We will uh, provide this kind of external passageway, which I'll show in a second on the next layout. Uh, this is a one metre, approximately one metre wide pavement uh, on the car deck. That means that we've got a clear passageway for passengers to walk down, but also wide enough for wheelchair users to use. Something we have on the existing vessels is both sides you're pushed right up against the bulkheads and it's not easy for access at either side. Um, within the lounge itself we'll include adjustable height tables, dedicated spaces for wheelchairs, uh, passageways minimum of one metre. Um, for the access to the passenger lounge the plan is for these to all be sliding doors so allow easy access. On the external staircases providing access to the, the sun deck we look to provide double height handrails um, and then we would provide coloured nosings on the staircases as we have on, on many of the small vessels uh, for visually impaired passengers. 
We also are looking at providing a portable induction loop system within the accessible toilet. And that brings me on to the inclusion of the lift. So as I mentioned, it can be quite challenging on a small vessel just due to the space and weight requirements on these smaller vessels. But we are investigating that at the moment and hopefully be able to provide some further updates in the, in the coming months. Next slide, please, Declan. And finally, before showing you some, some kind of high level layouts of the vessels, we have the crew levels and areas. So we have yet to finalise uh, the crew levels for these vessels. But as I'm sure many people are aware, these are determined through things such as the minimum safe manning of the vessel, the muster list requirements, the timetables that are being operated and the hours of rest that's required for the crew. Um, so CalMAC will um, look into these crewing levels and obviously adhere to all of these uh, things that we've mentioned, along with all the relevant regulations, and will engage with the unions for this. For crew areas on board, uh, this will be in line with the existing hybrid vessels, and we will include a mess room, uh, an office space, uh, and toilet and showering facilities. Next slide, please, Declan. So this is a view of the two uh, designs, the design A and the design B, if you're looking onto the front of the ship. Um, so you can see here on design A, as I was saying about the three car lanes compared to design B having the two car lanes. So it's just a narrower variant. But as I mentioned, the passenger lounge, the external sun deck, the crew area, the wheelhouse will all be the exact same for these design variants, bringing an element of standardization. Next slide, please, Declan. Now showing a plan view of what this looks like. So again, design A with the three car lanes and design B with two car lanes. Not got much detail shown here at the moment for passenger lounge, crew area and things like that, but we will provide more details in the coming months of kind of typical layouts that we're looking to provide. Uh, we have included two spaces, as you can see there forward and aft, that is space for bike storage. Um, this would be good to be utilised when the car deck is full and you can't have bikes on the car. There's no space for bikes on the car deck. As I mentioned, we have this kind of one meter pavement idea. Sorry, where you can see on both designs. On design A, this is this grey hatched area that goes from ramp right through to the other ramp. So the idea is that it provides a full passenger walkway as you come on the vessel and you go off the vessel. Likewise, on design B, it's the full length of the vessel, but we can't accommodate it on the ramps because we have a slightly narrower ramp there uh, with the design B. Uh, next slide, please, Declan. OK, one of one of the key parts of, of this whole feasibility study is the propulsion machinery concept studies. So for this project, we've investigated um, four propulsion machinery concept studies. The first one being diesel mechanical solution, which is in line with the existing lock class vessels. Now, as we're of, as Declan touched on in the introduction, we are on this journey towards net zero, so it is very unlikely that we would, we would proceed with num option number one. So this is really for reference and for comparison only. For option number two, we've looked at a hybrid solution that's in line with the existing hybrid vessels. That would obviously help us on our way, but this is what we've done 10 years ago, and ideally we're now looking towards zero emission solutions. So option number three and option number four. So the full electric solution with a built in backup diesel generator, which we would still call a zero emission solution and a full electric solution with a mobile backup diesel generator, again, a zero emission solution. Now, it is very clear that we cannot completely get away from diesel because diesel is required in certain cases, cases of emergency, cases of extending the range to dry dock. The vessel only goes to dry dock once a year, as long as everything's OK with the vessel. Of course, we know vessels can maybe take two or three trips, but it would be crazy to design the vessel with the full capacity to, to transit to dry dock, particularly for the kind of more northern routes when they are um, making their way down to the Clyde, etc. Um, so for options three and four, there is a, a backup diesel generator. We haven't yet made a decision on which one we'll be proceeding with, but we are along the lines of option number three, which is our preferred solution, as we just feel that this provides uh, more operational reliability and resilience for the network. Our goal is obviously to provide these vessels to be standardised, um, and this just allows that standardisation a bit more flexibility rather than having to bring a mobile generator on board. So the idea 
which we'll be able to present at our next uh, webinar, is to have kind of two battery rooms separated by a generator room within the middle. For Highland Council's Design C, slightly different. They are looking to proceed with option number four. Again, no full decisions yet to be making, but that's where they're proceeding along. This is slightly different requirements because it's being designed for one route. Um, so it's being designed for the Corrin Ardgour route. And also they're looking to, to, to do stuff to their infrastructure. As we are designing for six or seven routes here, it makes it slightly difficult. So, so option three is our preference. Next slide, please, Declan. OK, so that's has covered the, the vessel concept design and feasibility studies. I'm now going to cover a few slides on the port feasibility studies. First of all, to cover uh, all of these studies, I should mention that all the studies we've undertaken for the ports has been checked against the larger design A. So if design A can fit at the ports, then we have no issues with design B because the only difference being that it's a narrower vessel. For dredging, uh, and we have an image here of Cohoan, um, which you can see one of the ports where it's recommended, uh, sorry, where it's essential. Um, to accommodate this draft of 2.14 metres, essential dredging is required at these following locations. So Colin Trive, Locranza, Clonig, Portavadi, Cohoan, Tainloan and Lismore. So that is the recommendation for all of the end scope routes. Now, once we have a final deployment plan in place, it might not obviously be required at all of the routes, but it certainly will be required at some of those routes mentioned there. So we've yet to get a detailed programme for the dredging as this is done at the later stage in the port enabling works, what we call the options development stage. So that the programme for the dredging, along with any kind of disruption that might happen, that will all be worked out in that stage. And of course, we will share that with all stakeholders to make sure uh, that everyone's aware of, of the plans for going on. Uh, next slide, please, Deco. The next set of port enabling works that have been looked at is a number of infrastructure upgrades. Now, these are recommended rather than essential. Um, they are things that are almost like existing issues on, uh, on, the, um, on the network, things such as aligning structures, slipway widening and lengthening, overnight berth uh, refurbishment, and then some upgrades to look at potentially some new mooring bollards, crew gangways, and potential to look at winches. Um, fendering upgrades depending on, on this particular location. So these are not worked out. We've just got a cost identified for each of the ports, but we'll then look at this on a port by port basis once we have, once we have uh, the final deployment plan and we will work out what is actually required at the port for one of these new vessels. Also, it provides resilience for the, the, the route itself. If you take uh, the example shown there, which is a lock and var at Fishnish, there's currently no aligning structure there. So even for that existing vessel, an aligning structure would improve the reliability of the service. Um, again, once obviously further uh, we've, we've developed that, we'll then break it down port by port and, and engage with everyone on what's going on. Next slide, please, Declan. Shore power. So I think it's, it's probably clear to everyone that for an all electric vessel, shore power is essential. We have to be able to charge the vessel. Right now, our plan is to charge the vessel overnight. So we are only looking at providing a uh, shore, shore power and shore charging at the overnight berths, so not on both sides of a route. Um, we're not ruling out intermittent charging at this time, but um, so that's charging during the day, during the timetable, as not every timetable would allow for that for, for sufficient time. There are some timetables for some routes where on, on certain days you could charge during the day, but our assumptions are just that the vessel will be able to last the full timetable and will only have to charge overnight. On the right here, you've just got some examples of, of what's on the market there. Obviously, battery technology, all electric vessels have, have progressed in the past 10 years, and there is lots of uh, ideas out in the market. These are just two examples from a company called Cavatech, uh, the one being on the left from uh, a vessel that's in service uh, for Norled. Um, so during the studies we've carried out for the shore power, we know that it is feasible to have a shore power supply of a thousand amps, um, which is if you break that down to 720 kVA when you've got 415 volts at three phase. So we know that that is feasible um, for all the overnight berths. Um, and as I say, we will be investigating uh, shore charging devices uh, that will be looked at. 
Next slide, please, Declan. OK, and just to finish off on the ports, so there are a number of independent port projects, not all listed here as there is some other ones in, uh, kind of in progress that we'll be able to tell you about uh, later down the line. But these are kind of some of the main ones. These are independent of the small vessels, so these would be happening whether there were new small vessels coming or not. Um, but of course, we need to coincide with these uh, dependent on the final deployment plan. So some of the projects we've included here are improvements to traffic management, um, the Cumbria Slipway replacement project, which is a CMAL project, and the Iona and Finniff port redevelopments, which is an Argyll and Butte Council project. Next slide, please, Declan. OK, so now to touch on the in-scope routes and some of the deployment plan options. So just to refresh our minds, so uh, Declan at the start went through, if we put ourselves back in August 2021, we had a list of in-scope routes and really the short answer was that every uh, Euro C or UK categorised water route was in scope for this uh, phase one. But now the vessel design is looking likely that we've developed a Euro B type vessel, so we'll be able to operate on some of the Euro B routes. However, some of the Euro B routes probably require more specific vessel design than the kind of standardised one we have here. So this now leaves us with these nine routes that we have. So we've got Lars Cumbry, Colin Driver Bodock, Sconza Rassi, Locale and Fishnish, Tainloin Gia, Iona Finnefort, Tobermory Cahoon, um, Port of Addy, Tabot Lock Fine, and then one that's included at the bottom there, which was originally in phase two, it's Barra Eriski. Now that is currently a bit in limbo. It's sitting between phase one and phase two. We are looking that it could potentially be included there, but it may be likely that it makes its way into phase two. As you can see on the right hand side of the table, we've got the proposed design for each of these routes. So for the, the first ones, you can see the design A from Lars Cumbrae down to Loch Allen Fishnish, and then from Tainloin Gear down to Port Tavadi, Tabot Loch Fine are design Bs. And if Barra Eriski did make its way into phase one, we'd be proposing a larger design A vessel. So as we've kind of touched on just in some of the notes, the designs are based upon the carrying capacity requirements that have been worked out from the forecast demand analysis for each route. Um, on some of the routes that have either been moved out or moved into phase two, so the first one being Cloning Lock Ranza has been now uh, removed from the uh, phase one and, and really from phase two at the moment. But I'll provide some more details on that on the next slide. However, it should be noted that MV Katrina will remain an in-scope vessel because remember, as we touched on previously, this is not just about routes, it's also about the vessels and the potential that some vessels could move around, which is yet to be decided upon. Um, Oban Lismore, we've moved into phase two, and again, we'll come to talk about that on the next slide. However, I'm sure most people are aware Oban Lismore has one of the oldest vessels in the fleet, the Loch Striven. So we may look at an interim option to replace Loch Striven before we get to phase two. Malig Armadale has also been moved into phase two. Again, more on the next slide. And then we've already touched on Barra Eriski at the bottom there. Yeah, next slide, please, Declan. So the routes that have been removed from phase one, the first one, uh, just to go into a bit more detail here. So Cloney Glock Ranza has kind of been taken out of scope from both phases at the moment. And we've got the following reasons here. So the service being kind of the number one reason. Currently, Clonic Lopranza is a summer only service. Pardon me. Um, and for these electrical, uh, electric vessels, it really is an intention to put them on a dedicated route to begin with. So you, particularly the first couple, the goal at some point in time is to have every single port, every single route capable of handling, handling one of these all electric vessels. But we obviously have to focus uh, and start somewhere. So cloning or Kranza for that part, we see it has been removed. There are also a number of infrastructure upgrades that have been uh, highlighted from the port enabling uh, infrastructure study, particularly on the cloning side. And we just see the kind of timescales of this, uh, these upgrades out with uh, both phases just now. Oban Lismore, uh, I've kind of touched on slightly, um, has been moved to phase two. The main real reasons is is the slipway is not even sufficient for the existing vessel. The, the current vessel, Loch Striven, has to go in at a skewed angle, so the ramps are skewed on the slipway. So again, really to accommodate one of these all electric vessels, kind of some major works are required at the open slipway and to allow a better ramp interface. Also, open, the, the Loch Striven doesn't have a dedicated overnight berth 
it's currently uh, tied up on the North Pier, which is, as if you've been to Oban, it's, it's right, it's a public berth basically. Um, so it wouldn't really be ideal for overnight short charging. Um, for Malig Armourdale, we've moved this into phase two because we see this as being, this will benefit more from a dedicated vessel design that is capable of operating off link spans. Um, these vessels would be able to operate off link spans as the log fine can currently do. However, I think actually designing a specific vessel to work off link spans would be uh, certainly a better outcome for this route. Uh, and also this route has recently benefited, for, benefited from the Karus and it's now got a two vessel service in the summer with the MV Karusk and the MV Lock Fine. Next slide please Declan. So that brings us to the phase two routes which we'll obviously come back to talk about at a later time and um, but we have these kind of three almost four routes so Barra Eriski as I said is a bit of a kind of in between at the moment um, and probably by the kind of end of October We'll know exactly where that's sitting. Um, for Bernary Leverborough, we see this as very much being a, a, a bespoke vessel design for this route. Although we are designing a vessel that should be capable of operating on Euro B waters, um, if you've ever been to Bernary Leverborough, it's a very shallow route and the vessel would have to have a very shallow draft requirement. So it would be a bespoke design out with the standardised vessels we're designing here. And then we've touched on Malig Armadale and Oban Lismore. Uh, next slide, please, Declan. OK, this brings us on to deployment plan options for phase one. So we don't have an order of deployment yet. Our goal is to have this completed by the end of October, which we want to come back and talk to, to the communities about. Um, we have the routes there, the nine routes mentioned. And as uh, you can see, there's three different deployment plan options. So deployment plan option one is what we've kind of already discussed where we have a mixture of design A's and design B's based upon the forecast demand that has been carried out. The second deployment plan option is to have complete standardisation and only provide the larger design A's. The only downside of that would be in the meantime is it would be a, an over provision for some routes because 25 PCUs is not likely required for a number of them. However, it would, com it would provide complete standardisation. And the deployment plan option three is to provide design A's for all routes bar one, which is Iona Finnefort, where we're proposing a design B for this deployment plan option. The reason being Iona Finnefort doesn't get the same traffic that other islands get. You have to have a, a permit to take the car over. So a 25 uh, car ferry is probably a big over provision for that route in particular. However, that wouldn't uh, be too much of a problem if, say, the vessel was away to dry dock because all the other design A's would be capable of operating to Iona Finnefort for that kind of temporary two, three week period while the, the vessel would be at dry dock. So we don't have a preferred deployment plan at the moment. And as I say, we should be in a position by kind of mid to end of October where we would like to come back and speak to everyone about that. At that same time, we hope to have an order of deployment or a provisional order of deployment um, of, of of where we want to prioritise and also looking to start having decisions on vessels that are retained and vessels that are disposed. Uh, next slide please Declan. OK, so just to finish off uh, some information on the kind of way forward, so the, the summary and the planning dates. So just to give you an idea on the planning dates, so we're carrying out this public webinar tonight, 31st of August. We will then uh, obviously take all the questions we received tonight, we'll answer what we can tonight and any that we can't we'll include in the Q&A document and I should say we'll also include the ones we do answer. Uh, that Q&A document it probably will take us a, a few weeks to put together as you can probably appreciate it requires input from ourselves from Transport Scotland and from CalMAC so it takes a couple of weeks to, to put together but we aim to have that published by the kind of mid to end of September. We are then hoping to carry out another webinar uh, at the end of October. Now, I appreciate that a lot of the engagement we're now doing for other projects is, is being face to face. But as you can imagine, there are a lot of in scope routes here at the moment and to, to meet every single route face to face is pretty challenging. Um, so we will carry out another webinar and then following for future, we will look to have kind of uh, reference groups for each area and we'll look to carry out face to face engagement. We'll then similarly provide feedback on that webinar over the course of kind of November. We have the outline business case in November this year. 
and pending approval of that, we would then be looking to go out for vessel procurement. So if just to make everyone aware of how the procurement works, it happens in two stages. The first one being the contract notice, also known as the SPD, the Single Procurement Document Scotland, uh, or it used to be called the PQQ. Um, that would then uh, happen around kind of end of November, start of December, probably absolute latest January. Um, following that, we would then go out with the second phase of procurement, the invitation to tender, which would be Q1, end of Q1 2023. The procurement phase, uh, as we've, we've just recently done for Isla, took us around nine months, but that was cut, cutting it a bit fine. So we want to give ourselves a good bit of time here and we do see ourselves uh, awarding the contract kind of end of 2023. So around about November, December 2023. For Vessel 1 delivery, we've put a period in there at the moment of 24 months for the full contract period. So this is the, the detailed design and build stage. And so that would make the Vessel 1 delivery Q4 2025. We would then plan for Vessels 2 to 7 to be delivered at kind of four to six month intervals, um, obviously depending on who the shipyard may be, discussions with them. It is still to be uh, decided amongst ourselves on whether we will go out for all seven vessels at one time or whether we will split this into two different contracts. The deployment plan option selected may obviously impact this because if we go out for design A's and a, a mixture of design A's and a mixture of design B's, then it may make sense to have contract for A's and contract for B's, but we'll be able to price, provide some further information on that uh, in the next webinar. If you then take the kind of four to six months for all the rest of the vessels, that would, if we do build seven vessels, that would take us up to uh, phase one completion, Q1 2028. Now, there are no dates currently shown there for phase two, but we're not just going to forget about phase two. Work will start on that uh, over the kind of next year. For the port enabling works, these will be developed on a port by port basis and we'll also engage on a port by port basis for them. Um, and as we've uh, kind of said there, further engagement likely to be face to face will take place once the final deployment plan is in place. Just to finish off then, uh, to summarise and the way forward. Um, so we are still ongoing with the vessel concept design and the feasibility studies, and the aim is to complete these by the end of the year. For that first stage of procurement, um, we don't have to have the completed concept design, but for the ITT stage we do. Decisions that have to be made uh, by ourselves over the kind of next month or two is the deployment plan options, probably the key one, um, the order of the vessel deployment and the vessel cascading and retaining. I should say disposing, sorry, cascading and retaining are the same thing. At the next public webinar, so I, our kind of planning date for that is end of October and we'll share some information on that as soon as possible, but we'll look to provide some further details on uh, the vessel designs and some proposed layouts for the passenger areas. We'll also provide feedback on the comments that we've received and look to answer uh, that with the presentation as much as we possibly can. Uh, we'll provide an update on the planning dates and if we're still on track for those kind of procurement timelines and um, provide an update on the next level of reference groups that, that Declan had touched on, um, on looking to break that down. This will, of course, depend upon the deployment plan. We'll obviously prioritise vessel number one over vessel number seven, um, but we will look if you've got vessels that are kind of close together, sorry, routes that are close together, it probably makes more sense to have a reference group that covers the, the kind of routes that are close together. Um, next slide, please, Declan. So thank you very much, everyone. I do apologise again for the technical issues. Hopefully we've managed to cover ourselves. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Brian Fulton, who's going to host the Q&A session. We will, slide, it's just coming on for 20 to 8, so we will run just over 8 o'clock. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks very much, Lewis. Um, and also thanks very much to Declan for stepping in at the very last minute. Um, very impressive given the, the te technological challenges that you had. So uh, well done. I thought it was a great presentation. Um, pleased to say that we've got lots of questions coming in. We've also got representatives uh, online here from, well, you've seen Lewis and Declan um, from CMAL. We've also got the Ports team at CMAL. Uh, we've got uh, CalMac online and we've got Transport Scotland. So please keep the questions coming in. If we can't get through all of the questions, then they will be on the Q&A, but if you put your details 
into the question, we can also get back personally after this, um, after the event. Uh, for those of you who had trouble connecting at the start, or those of you that um, have joined us halfway through, you'll be able to get the presentation online as of tomorrow morning. So um, I'm just going to go through these in, in, in no particular order, and I'm going to start putting some people on the spot. Um, as I say, there's some really good questions. So uh, let's start with a, a really easy one. What are you going to do to provide improved weather resilience for the impact of global warming with more onerous weather patterns and an expectation from communities for improved weather resilience? So there'll be a little bit on uh, the vessels and I'll obviously a little bit on the ports there. So I'll start with vessels and I know you've just been doing lots and lots of talking, Lewis, but I'll put you back on the spot in that one. Uh, thanks, Brian. No problem at all. So we can answer that um, from the kind of vessel design point of view, as as we've kind of touched on. Um, something we haven't covered tonight is the kind of propulsor types, which we're also looking at. We do look to provide propulsors that can obviously increase the manoeuvrability of the vessels, provi provide a better kind of station holding capability over the existing vessels. We're always wanting to improve on that, so that will certainly help with with the resilience, um, particularly in as the weather you're talking about. I did also touch on the port enabling works there and, and some options that obviously look to improve resilience, but I'm not sure maybe if Corey, you want to add anything to that from the port side? Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, like you um, said in your presentation, Lewis, that the ports are at um, feasibility stage just now. So when we move on to um, options development, we'll look more at the sort of wave modelling and the wind roads and obviously design, um, you know, taking in the current um, guidance to the, the, the predicted sea level rises as well. So that will all be taken into consideration at the, the options development stage and then again at the detailed design stage. Super, thank you. Um, the next one is on the EU rules uh, that were mentioned. Um, so we'll probably be talking Euro B, Euro C. Uh, again, back to yourself, uh, Lewis, is there any possibility of those EU rules changing? Thanks, Brian. So a uh, good question. And at the moment, no, um, there is still the plan to adopt the EU directive. Um, it's still what we're, we're designing and building to, particularly our most recent ones, the, the two new Isla vessels. They are being in, uh, designed and built to the, the latest, uh, not the latest EU uh, directive, um, as that's not been adopted, but we are still on the kind of earlier version of that. So we still have an element of it and there's no plans for that to change. OK, thanks for that, Lewis. Um, there's a number of questions around capacity, uh, not least of all the Loch Bui and also on the large Cumbria route. So the first one, uh, is on the Loch Bui and it needs to retain the 250 passenger certificate for busy times of the tourist season. I'll layer that one in with a capacity of 150 passengers as a 25% reduction for Largs Cymru. Given the large queues of passengers that get left behind at peak periods, then we would request a review of these figures. And then there's a couple later on that reflect the uh, the IOTA 250, so it needs increased passenger capacity. Uh, and yeah, so I think in general, those two routes, passenger capacity. Um, so I'll maybe go to Cal Mac, first of all. Hey, hi, I'm Nicola Hurrell. I'm the programme manager at Cal Mac. I'm happy to have these questions around uh, Largs and Iona. We are looking at these routes specifically to better understand the future um, foot passenger capacity requirement. It is something that we're actively working on just now. And as part of the Q&A, we'll be able to perhaps provide a little bit more detail and context around the required capacity for those routes. OK, thanks very much, Nicola. So, so they're being looked at. Um, for an all electric solution, what confidence do you have that the battery systems will be able to operate for a full working day without timetable disruption to plug in and charge? It's a particular concern in stormy days when the thrusters are working hard or after a few years as the batteries age. It's not acceptable that services disrupted to communities because the batteries aren't capable of running a full day. 
So uh, battery technology, Lewis. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, no, it's a great question and maybe something we can provide further information on at our next webinar. We, we didn't obviously want to go into too much detail on that tonight. But no, the, these batteries will be sized for the absolute worst case scenario on the most demanding route. So because these are standardised vessels, we obviously are providing the same battery capacity for every single route. Um, the reason we've got the backup diesel generator is in that case of emergencies. Uh, the main one being that if, say, the shore supply were to fail, we can actually start the diesel generator before the timetable begins, and that we can then charge the batteries throughout the course of the day. We're really being kind of on the, the the excessive side with the figures we're using. We're including quite a kind of high sea margin, uh, so kind of rough day, rough weather, um, kind of rough sea state. Also looking at things like it's a full timetable without any breaks. So we're not, although a, a timetable might have a one hour break in it, we're not considering that. We're just considering that these vessels are back and forward all, all day long. So we are sizing these batteries for the absolute worst case scenario and having that backup diesel generator there to just give us that extra little bit of reliability. Uh, thanks, Lewis. Would I be right in saying that battery technology has come on in leaps and bounds over, over the years? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Brian. Um, and send myself live here. Uh, obviously, when we done the the first uh, hybrid, the Halig, that was that was over ten years ago. Now, the, the design for that actually started in two thousand and nine. So, as you can imagine, the, it was very early technology, the, the battery technology, particularly for vessels, and that that led to the Halig being the first Ropax uh, ferry uh, hybrid in the world. That. The battery technology has come on leaps and bounds. Uh, we're, we're not the only ones looking at this. The Norwegians have have got lots of all electric vessels in service now, so it is a very familiar technology and has certainly improved. Thanks, Lewis. A bit of a ports question next. Um, is there no current recognised international standard for shore charging? What's the current procurement strategy to ensure that shore charging electrical and communication connections are seamlessly interfaced with the vessel and that the battery is protected to ensure its operational design life without early degradation. You thanks, want to call it? Yeah, on you go, Corey. Yeah, no, thanks, Brian. Really, really good question. Um, and like we said, with the feasibility studies that we've done on the port side, that sort of to establish that we can get the power that we need to the ports and where the charging's from. The next stage, as Lewis has been talking about, about the capacity on the boats, is for us to, to, to look at this more closely with the vessel steam and how that interface is, is going to um, happen. So I don't know if Lewis wants to add anything else to that. Yeah, I can do. No problem, Corey. Um, so absolutely good good point. And the whole point is to have, again, standardised short charging, and it's the same for all vessels, um, completely compatible. Like the batteries, the shore charging technology has also progressed in, in the past few years and there are lots of solutions out in the market. Now, I, I showed two solutions from, from one supplier, but there are multiple suppliers and, and we've seen lots of these in likes of Norway and Denmark. So we have a good idea uh, of what we'll be uh, what we'll be looking at. Back to yourself, Brian. Yep, thank you. Um, so this one is a question on draft and again, we're back to the Iona ferry. Um, will draft be an issue for the Iona ferry? I can answer that, yeah. Okay, no, uh, it, it won't be. Uh, as you, you're aware, the Iona and Finnefort, there's redevelopment uh, projects going on for there just now, and this increased draft won't be an issue for Iona. Uh, so that has all been checked. Okay, thanks, Lewis. It's reassuring. Um, carriage of bicycles, so slightly different from passengers, but back to, to Largs Cumbria, carriage of bicycles is an increasing feature on many of the small vessels. How are you going to accommodate this increase without short shipping cars, which is an issue currently on the Largs uh, to Cumbria uh, when other car spaces are sacrificed on the Loch Ridden, currently to carry 10 to 20 bicycles? How will the designs avoid this in future? So is there space on the, on the vessels? Have, have we taken into account bicycles? Yep, I can answer that, Brian. No problem. Thank so, you. just on the layouts, obviously it was a very high-level layout with not much detail, but we do have two bike stores uh, 
uh, provision for two bike stores on the vessel. Um, for when the car deck's not full, they may not have to be utilised. That will obviously be down to the, the preference of the crew. But the idea is when you do have a full car deck, um, you're able to, to then put bicycles in the stores. I can't give you an exact number of how many would be able to fit in there, but that's maybe something we can take away and come back to you with uh, and, and provide a bit of a more detailed layout on what we can fit in these stores. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, why have two designs when more flexibility across the network to move vessels around if you standardised on one larger design? You may have answered this during the presentation, but uh, the, the, there's no har harm in repeating. So sorry, Brian, can you repeat that first bit? Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Why have two designs when it would be yeah. more flexibility across the network to move vessels around if you standardise on one larger design? I think this is the piece about the length yeah. and yeah. the breadth. Yeah, no, th thank you. No, it's, it's a really good point. And what we wanted to do is develop different de designs for the different capacities that were identified. Um, as obviously we've, we've since realised the best option is to go for the same length and the same draft of the vessel and the only thing that changes is the beam. So we've developed these two different concepts, uh, obviously the, the third design C, but we've then got to make that decision on whether we do decide to go and build two different sizes or whether we just decide, uh, uh, decide to build the one. As I'd kind of touched on in the presentation, the 25 PCU ferries, the larger one, will be an over provision for, for some of the routes. We, we are seeing that from the forecasting figures and it's whether, but again, it, it could be that we're future proofing to make sure that hey, who knows what happens in the future with certain routes. Um, as we touched on for our own Affinifort, it, it's very unlikely that we would need a 25 car ferry. So that's really for us to, over the next kind of month or two, make a final decision on that and, and provide some kind of further evidence on that in the next, next webinar. Excellent, thank you. And on operating timetables that we're designing to, um, what's the longest day? So the, the suggestion here is will it be able to operate from six in the morning until 10 at night, um, which is really Largs Cumbria, I suppose, on a Friday? Yeah. No, uh, uh, absolutely, Brian. So Largs Cumbria really is the worst case, um, not, not worst case in terms of weather, but worst case in terms of um, obviously the the length of the timetable. So that is what we are basing the size of the kind of battery capacity uh, on. OK, thank you. Um, having dedicated vessels, does this mean in the case of a breakdown, vessels are less likely to be redeployed? I think you've answered that in the flexibility question. Yeah. I think the answer to that is no, they're not less likely to be redeployed because they can, they should be able to be flexible across the piece. Yeah, I can just that, so that that is the total idea. These can again, as I touched on in the port works, we've checked against the higher design A. So it means even if we had a design B vessel, for example, and that vessel was either broken down, away to dry dock, whatever it might be, we can then have the flexibility of moving design A. This is of course the first phase of this, where we're looking at these kind of six up up to six or seven vessels, and this is just the kind of starting point. So the hope is that, that the majority of these small vessel routes will have one of these vessels at some point in time. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question for Transport Scotland, I think, on this one. Where's the finance coming from? Thanks, Brian. I'm happy to take that. Um, it's Michael Keane here, um, Project Manager on Small Vessels from, from Transport Scotland. Yeah, thanks Thanks very much for the question. Very important, fundamental question there. Um, just, just to make you aware that phase one of the programme um, is included within the government's infrastructure investment plan. Now, this plan does end in 2026, at which point obviously allocation will be revisited. And I think in a more kind of general point, funding is obviously subject to the approval of, of the various outline and final business cases by our investment decision board and ministers. So hopefully that, that answers the question. There, Brian. Um, I don't know if Paul Linhart McCasco wants to add anything more substantive to that, or we're happy to go with that. Happy to go with that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Now, <coughs> slightly lengthy question, but um, with Mali Garmadale's key to have a one-off design for replacing Loch Fine to operate alongside Kurusk, which is just 19 years old. So, what's the view of what will happen 
When the Mallig Armadale stag is initiated, it's been mooted that a shuttle with, for example, locked in Vagan, whilst the link span is closed and that slipways will be needed for this temporary arrangement, a minimum of a year, whilst the refurb of Armadale takes place. Carusk and Lochfine both have current PCUs of th uh, round about 36. And so what's the overall thought of the service whilst the stag development is in progress? The stag is based on current in-scope vessels. We and colleagues in Mallig are happy to input going forward. Who wants to take that one? I think it's on stag, might be a TS one. Sorry, could you repeat the question again, uh, Brian? <laughs> so the question is essentially what's going to happen during the year that the, Ar the Armadale is being developed? The refurb of Armadale when it takes place. Karusk and Loch Fine both have current PCUs of 36. And so what's the overall thought of the service whilst stag development is in progress? Is that one that we'll take away? Take yeah, away we'll, think, yeah, I think so, yeah. we'll, we'll take we'll take that one away and uh, and we will yeah. we'll put that on to the Q&A. Uh, we can respond directly as well because we know who it's from. Uh, if it's suggested was an option and CMA will go out for two different procurement phases for vessels, how would you intend uh, to ensure commonality of critical equipment such as batteries, propulsors and drivetrain? Maybe one for Lewis. Yeah, I can answer that, no problem. So the vessels would have, uh, from a kind of starting point, it would have uh, the same technical specification that we'd be going out to tender with. Um, obviously, as it's public procurement, we're in a position where we can um, specify all of the makers that we want to have for likes of what you mentioned there, propulsors, batteries, these type of things. But I'm pretty sure um, th there's a lot of benefits of, of being able to try and have the same same ones. So we'll certainly ensure that, that if we did go for two contracts, we will absolutely have a commonality between, particularly even um, there is an element of batteries that we're including on the new Isla vessels. And we're also looking into, can we include commonality with those batteries compared to the batteries we're going to have in these vessels? So it will certainly be something that we'll be, be ensuring for these vessels. OK, thank you. Now, the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, will opening car doors obstruct the external passenger passage passageway? That's a, an easy one, I think. Yeah, if somebody can put me live. Uh, so the, the plan is no. Um, so I, if you maybe remember the, the kind of section view that I showed where you can see the different car lanes. So this, uh, there's still space between the car and the kind of pavement uh, that we're talking about, the kind of marked area. So you wouldn't be right up against it. Um, so there will be space there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to rush through these if I can. Um, so one on supply chain. Will you be encouraging promoting the use of UK suppliers for vessel builds? Yeah. No problem, I can answer that. Um, yep. just, sorry, just try to put myself live there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Always always trying to encourage um, as far as we can. Like I say, we, we have to go out to a competitive tender. Um, we can as it's public procurement, we can specify who we want to, to build these vessels, who we want to supply the equipment, so uh, it will be the planning to go out for a competitive tender. OK, and a question on hydrogen. Um, maybe one for, for, for Declan as well on this one. Uh, presumably hydrogen technology is still not developed enough as regards propulsion. Uh, maybe I can... Yep, there Maybe are hydrogen start. ferries or, or hydrogen ready ferries out there. I don't know if there's any actual hydrogen ferries, but um, yeah, I can maybe start and it's lucky that we've got Declan here tonight, so uh, maybe Declan can jump in with this as well. So just thinking, of, of course, it's, it has been considered. Hydrogen is obviously seen as one of the fuels of the future. However, it is, it is still early in the phase, um, particularly for the West Coast routes that we're looking at. Um, as Brian rightfully said, there is currently no hydrogen ferries in operation. There is one that's, that's labelled as a hydrogen ferry, but it's currently not operating in hydrogen. And, potentially until the end of this year, uh, start of next year, that will be in Norway. Um, we have got an alternative project on the go at the moment, um, which has actually just made the news yesterday uh, called High Seas Free, and Declan uh, has been involved in that. So Declan, I don't know if you maybe want to, to chip in with that. 
Yeah, no, exactly as you've just mentioned there, Lewis. So we have been working on an alternative hydrogen design vessel for the Orkney Islands at the moment. We have just achieved a milestone there of getting an approval in principle on the hydrogen aspects of the design. At this stage, it is still a real novel technology. As Lewis said, the, the vessel out in Norway is, has, been op has been in service for a year, but still hasn't actually ran on hydrogen yet. So I think there's the supply chain issues, the actual technology itself still developing. I think we are still a wee while away before we'll see it in, in regular kind of operating service. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question back to cycles. We're assuming that um, cycles can be accommodated in Cardex space if it permit, if space permits. Uh, yeah, so sorry, is that Brian saying that the other space can still be space on the Cardex? Yeah, cycles can yeah. be accommodated in so, the Cardex if space permits. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. If space permits, we, um, I mean, it might be down to the favour of the crew that it's, it's easier for operation for quick turnaround times to have them there. But again, as I was saying earlier on, when you do have a full car deck, space does really become tight for, for bicycles, as we experience on the current small vessels. And we don't have any dedicated stores uh, on the small vessels, so that's the kind of idea to be able to provide some space that we can we can include bikes. OK, thank you. Um, and has our design team made any decisions on potential propulsion equipment and battery suppliers? Um, just back to myself. Uh, no, we, we haven't made any any fixed decisions on that. So we have worked with a number of suppliers during these concept stages. Now it is obviously just the concept design, so that doesn't mean there's any agreement in place to then uh, provide. We have looked at for lights of the propulsors. We've looked at different types, uh, assessed all our different capabilities. Same with the batteries. We've looked at all the benefits that each battery type will bring. But really what that will come down to is, is down to our specification, what we are looking for and what the chosen shipyard uh, wants to supply. So, so that's when we we'll make decisions on all, all of this equipment. Okay, thanks, Lewis. We've got another funding question. Is funding guaranteed for these seven vessels or is it still to be signed off by Scottish Government? I'm back to, to Transport Scotland for that one. I'm happy to take that, Brian. Really, thanks, Michael. Again, yeah, no worries. I think I, I mentioned it earlier in, in the answer previously that obviously they still need to be signed off as part of the, the kind of business case process by firstly the investment decision making board at Transport Scotland and moreover uh, ministers. So so that, that still has to, to take place and we're working towards that as part of the, the outline business case that we're all drafting just now. So thank you. Thank you. Um why is passenger space at Cardec level not raised in a fixed mezzanine so that there's more available vehicle space, so I guess, going up and over the Cardec? Yep, I can answer that. So the intention is to have the uh, main passenger lounge on the Cardec mainly for accessibility purposes, as I kind of touched on um, access up to, to the kind of sun deck level. It is going to be tricky. We are looking at, at options to provide a lift um, for persons with reduced mobility. So really the whole whole reason of having that main, main lounge on the car deck level is for accessibility reasons. Um, the external area will obviously be, all be open and provide obviously able to provide views for everyone, um, but we really want to, to try and have, include the accessibility here. Okay, thank you. Another quick hydrogen question is High Seas, uh, the specific project High Seas 3 with its hydrogen propulsion option ruled out for the SVRP or even newer technology of ammonia. But I guess could they be future proofed? I'll throw that in there as well. Yeah, I can maybe answer that just now. Uh, Declan, if you want to jump in, you can do, but I can start yeah. it off. Um, so, so yeah, uh, we have obviously we know the high seas uh, project is ongoing as as it's ourselves that are working on it. So hydrogen and I would say both ammonia are really ruled out at this stage. Ammonia is obviously becoming another competitive fuel that can be used, but really it is still a bit of time away from that. And particularly for passenger ships, uh, we really are seeing ammonia will probably be used on more kind of uh, commercial ships such as freight vessels and uh, cargo ships and stuff like that to begin with. It might, I would no doubt imagine, it would make its way to passenger vessels. Um, but for this small vessel replacement program, it's not being considered. In terms of future proofing, obviously we have 
two large battery compartments. So there is obviously scope in the future to potentially future proof, but we haven't we haven't like designed anything specifically into the vessel uh, at the moment in time. Yeah, and just to completely loose, um, just to add to that as well, the the High Seas project is looking at a route in Orkney uh, to the Isle of Shappensee, which is using curtailed wind energy on the island, so they potentially would have um, storage of hydrogen ready to bunker for the vessel. A lot of the routes that has been raised here tonight, a lot of them are in isolated areas. We'd have to consider storage solutions as well. Where do we get the hydrogen from? So there's a lot of other aspects to consider as well, which is making it probably technically unfeasible just now for so many routes. OK, thank you both. Um, the next one, surprised to hear that Halle, Glockenvar and Catrona are in scope as relatively young vessels. Are they fit for purpose for the mid to late uh, 2020s? Um, I, I, I think they're in scope in, in the sense that they may be cascaded in some way, but um, you maybe yeah. confirm that? Yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, sorry, should maybe have made that clear and we can maybe we can maybe do that on the presentation. So there is a lot of the kind of newer vessels such as the free hybrids that are in scope, as Brian said, for cascading purposes. So uh, as you've seen on, on the list of in scope routes that we're at now, we've got uh, Sconza Rassi and Loch Allen Fishness, which currently have the hybrid vessels. So if we did deem that one of these vessels was to uh, one of these routes was to receive an all electric vessel, then we'd look to put one of these vessels elsewhere, but no decisions have been made. But they're definitely not any plans to dispose of these vessels, and we fully intend that they will they will last their full lifetime as intended. Thank you. Um, presumably, v vessels will be able to serve numerous routes for operational flexibility. I think we've already covered that on flexibility, which they will be. Um, I'm aware that space is of a premium on small vessels, but I was wondering whether there is space on board for, ves uh, for vessels for privacy. Lots of health and social care services are on the mainland and having a private space on your journey can be vital. Is there going to be an, uh, any any area for, for privacy? Um, I can answer that, Brian. So at, at this moment in time, there's, there's nothing included uh, within the design for that. It's something we can potentially look at. I wouldn't. Me, sorry, I wouldn't say that it would be able to be a a full dedicated space like we have on some of the larger vessels because obviously space requirements, but I'm sure there can be something that's included, um, perhaps maybe a curtained off area, these kind of things. We have seen some examples on vessels uh, in, in other, other countries where they have this on their, their, their smaller vessels. So it's a good comment and it's something we'll take away and have a look at. Thank you. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, have you considered the potential for battery swaps via removable containers or cubes? Um, can answer that. Uh, yep. No, we haven't. Uh, if this is, if you're referring to on the vessel, no, we haven't. Purely because this would um, remove, obviously, carrying capacity from the vessel. So it's not something we have considered at this stage. We have considered that. Um, Obviously, the, the battery compartments will be able to house house the batteries underneath the vehicle deck, and that we're providing easy access in the event that they ever have to be removed um, in future time. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there's actually a follow up to the previous question. Additionally, would the wheelchair spaces be integrated so people who use wheelchairs can socialise with their friends? Too often, wheelchair spaces are separate. The accessible facilities shown so far today have been really impressive. Height adjustable tables are great. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, as I say, we haven't shown any detailed layouts there, but some of them we'll definitely consider. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's not a huge passenger lounge, so uh, we may obviously be restricted to how many spaces we will have. But no, it's a good idea and something we can look at and hopefully be able to show you at the next uh, webinar. Thank you. Um, he, here's a good question. Um, will the vessels be charged in between sailings? And if so, will that be at both ends of the route or just one? OK, can answer that. Uh, so right now, uh, as I kind of covered in the presentation, the plan is only to charge overnight. So we're only looking to provide shore charging at the, the overnight berth. Um, so as we've, as I've said, we've sized the batteries so that it can last the timetable for the full day without having to charge. But we're not completely ruling out intermittent charging. So for during the day um, on some routes, this may be possible because there's maybe a one hour layover, uh, etc. 
but there is other routes where where there's there's no time in the timetable. So unless there were any changes in the timetables, then we wouldn't be able to carry that out. So as I'd said before, there's no no plans to change the time. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Um, the question on the timing, uh, can you not accelerate the design and build programmes to provide these vessels faster than the end of 2025 for the first one? You talked through the timeline, but maybe just just um, elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, as I kind of touched on in that timeline, particularly uh, the procurement phase, so the, the absolute minimum we can we can do that procurement phase in is nine months. But as I said, for Isla, that really was uh, cutting it fine, I would say. So we, we have given ourselves a bit more scope. So again, this is just planning dates. Um, it might be in reality that it happens slightly quicker. Um, we don't know at this stage. So we have planned for kind of 11 or 12 months for procurement. We've then given uh, obviously the 24 month design and build period for the first vessel. We, we just want to keep that at the moment. Um, we could potentially in the future maybe reduce that down, but we just want to have a, a good kind of good planning dates up our sleeve that we don't kind of go the opposite way and, and we, we don't uh, kind of give ourselves enough time. So that's the reason for the, the longer timelines. Uh, but for, for, for this kind of small vessel, um, kind of 20 to 24 months is probably typical for the design and build. But once we've designed one, then then you pretty much have the design for the rest. So the, it's just a case of building them. Thanks, Lewis. Um, somebody who missed the presentation it is actually in the presentation, but if you could maybe uh, cover this very briefly, has consideration of a hybrid set set up being considered to get the best of both worlds, electric drive and robustness configuration would enable uh, to offset current high electricity costs? Yep, no, good question. And um, I'd, I have answered that in the presentation, but happy to answer again. So we have looked at it. Um, we have also looked at just purely diesel mechanical, um, but a big goal of this uh, programme is, is looking towards the net zero objectives um, and really the hybrid solution doesn't get as, get as close enough to, to the kind of net zero that we're looking at. So that's why we're looking at the two zero emission options. Um, as I kind of mentioned in the presentation, we can't get away from the use of diesel, uh, particularly for the kind of emergency situations and also like transit to dry dock. Um, so there will still have to be an element of diesel included, but not anywhere near as much as what we would have for a hybrid. Problem? You're doing well, Lewis. Uh, our ramp's going to be quicker at going up and down. I'm, I'm assuming that's in comparison to the ones that they're replacing. Yes, I can answer that. Um, very detailed information that we probably don't have at this moment in time. Uh, I would say the ramp design would probably follow what we have on the hybrids, which I don't believe has been too much of a concern. But I guess this is maybe in relation to some of the law class vessels. Uh, and absolutely, we know that some of those ramps are very, very slow to, to go up and down. So I would say it would certainly be an improvement on the law class vessels. Um, but I would imagine a kind of similar time frame to the, the operation of the hybrid ramps. Thank you. Uh, have any of the design team visited Norwegian electric ferry operators to learn from their extensive experience? Yes, I can answer that. So we have visited um, a number of, of, of vessel operators. We've been out uh, to Norway, Germany, Denmark, um, spent quite a good bit of time on the Ellen, which is operating from uh, out to the island of Aero. So that's uh, an all electric vessel. So yeah, we have obviously done our, our research. We've been working closely with a lot of companies. Um, similarly, in the value that we're working with, uh, they're a German based company in Flensburg. So they have good connections all around kind of Scandinavia, who really are at the forefront of this for, for all electric vessels. Um, so we have some good relationships with the other operators and owners that are out there. Okay, another technical question. Um, will the standby diesel uh, be able to be uh, operated automatically if there's a power cut overnight? Avoid the crew turning up to find the batteries haven't charged overnight due to power outage. Yeah, good, good. Good question. Um, I would say probably not something we've, we've looked at. And again, this will be more for the specification uh, for then the shipyard to develop. What I can tell you our intentions right now is that if the crew did turn up in the morning, which is, is for most routes is about 30 to 45 minutes before the timetable actually starts. Uh, so we're, our assumption at the moment 
is that the, the diesel generator would be started 30 minutes. So this is in, if we turn up and the shore power has failed and obviously not charged the batteries, we start the generator 30 minutes before the timetable starts. That obviously takes us to a certain point of charge on the batteries and we're able to start the timetable. That generator would then remain on all day and charge the batteries as we operate. And as, as I was saying earlier on, we are working to that to kind of the worst case scenarios. So the worst weather, the busiest timetable, we're not stopping at all during the day. So um, that's that's the kind of basis for that. So maybe something we can look to provide a bit more information on uh, for the next webinar. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Um, catamarans, have catamarans from proven catamaran designers been considered uh, for the small vessel replacement programme? Yep, can answer that, no problem at all. So for, for our vessel designs, we, we we always do consider the various types of hulls. Um, oh, sorry, they couldn't see my life. Um, so yep, we're not just be, yeah, we're not just um, looking at mono hulls only, but really for this this program in particular, the fact that we're operating off of the slipways, um, a catamaran obviously doesn't really lend itself to, to the operation that the the kind of double ender does that we're looking at. Um, other reasons being obviously we, we require the kind of higher draft on here as a touchstone uh, to give us a bit more displacement because of the kind of batteries that we're carrying. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we do have around five megawatt hours of batteries on here, so that does weigh quite a bit. So we're having the kind of double ender with the extra bit of draft gives us a bit more displacement for that. Thank you. Um, will the smaller design have the same battery capacity as the larger design? Yes, that is the, the current intention. So the, both both battery, eh, both vessels have been eh, sized for the same battery capacity. Um, so there's no intention for that to change. So as, as I maybe kind of touched on, Design V is almost like the one we're developing a bit further at this moment in time, because eh, if, if we can accommodate everything on Design V, then we have no issues accommodating it on Design A. Thank you. Uh, and in community consultation, there's been several route specific issues raised through this webinar, Cumbria and Iona, for example. What community consultation will you have to address these issues? I think that goes into the um, the, the next level of, of reference group meetings. Would that be right? Yeah, uh, so we will, as we kind of touched on, we will be looking to then go into the next level of reference groups. We'll, we'll start to engage with obviously third party port owners, uh, ferry committees, community councils to get views. Uh, in terms of the, the independent projects I spoke about, likes of the, the, the Cumbria Slipway, there has been engagement all that, for that already, I believe. Um, and for Iona Finnefort, I'm sure I, I'm not directly involved in that. Uh, unfortunately, our colleague's not here tonight, but who can answer that question? But I'm sure that's all been, been looked at as well. Thank you. Um, spare vessel, would we have a spare vessel that could be used when the others have to go into dry dock, breakdowns, etc.? Uh, yeah, can answer answer that one as well. So right now the intention would be not to replace, a, not to have a new vessel as a spare vessel. So we will still look to have spare vessels, absolutely. Um, and this all comes into the deployment plan and the cascading uh, and disposing of vessels. So it, I don't think there would be any value for money in having a brand new all electric vessel sitting tied up ready to go. But we will obviously have one of the kind of older vessels, but not the not the kind of 80s boats in the early, early 90s. So that's all being looked at at the moment and hopefully we can provide further detail on that in the next webinar. Yep. Uh, have opportunities for longer operating hours been investigated by reducing on duty crew numbers, overlapping crew rotors each day and so on? That might be something that uh, I don't think is part of this project, but it will certainly be uh, coming along with the island connectivity plan. I don't know if uh, TES might have, uh, Transport Scotland might have something to to add to that, just in, in in sense of timetables, any I think there's some consultation coming round on on that. Yep, happy to take that one. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Brian. Uh, yes, uh, Paul and Norman Caskell Transport Scotland. Uh, there will be a, a raft of uh, engagements basically included uh, through the Island Connectivities Plan, uh, where specific uh, 
specific uh, island community and route specific uh, issues will actually be discussed with the communities to inform specification of uh, routes going forward and uh, the needs of the community uh, and the services that uh, the operator of the CHIF service will actually provide. Uh, as I said, those engagements will be occurring uh, in the coming uh, months. Uh, I know that colleagues have uh, have already engaged on some uh, some points, basically with uh, various island community groupings uh, and a full uh, kind of timetable, or at least an indication as to which uh, sectors and which uh, regions will be uh, visited when uh, will hopefully be published sometime soon. Excellent, thank you. Now, it's probably we're now at quarter past eight. Um, there are a good few questions left, but I've probably come to an appropriate one. If I feel that any of my questions have not been answered, is there any opportunity for a follow up? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, you can see the uh, the details on the screen just now uh, for the in the Q and A session. There's the uh, the project page, the Q and A document with all of the questions that haven't been asked uh, will will be produced with answers. Um, and if you contact us at the email address that you can see in the screen there and ask your question specifically through that, then you'll get a quicker answer. Um, uh, we'll be able to answer that one, one very promptly. So um, I'm thinking that we're now 17 minutes over running. We will probably wrap up at that point, Lewis. Yep, ha happy to do so. Um, thank and, you very and, much, and, and apologies, I should say, to those whose questions I haven't managed to get to. There are there are a lot of questions, but you'll get to see everybody's questions and all of the answers. And please keep the questions coming in. Yep. Brian, maybe if I'll just finish off then. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. OK. So thank you very much, everyone. And again, apologies for the, the technical issues we experienced at the start. Um, as Brian rightfully said, um, Keep the questions coming in. If you feel after today that you've got further questions, we've got the mailbox there. We're happy for everybody to email into that and ask us some questions and we'll do our best to answer. So um, for follow up, we'll, we'll obviously have the Q&A document and then we'll look to carry out another webinar at the end of October, which will provide some details within the next kind of three to four weeks. So once again, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, a good night. Thank you.